How does one revel in the understanding that they are everything without anything? How does one learn to appreciate not the adding or chasing of desires, but the understanding that we are whole? This is hard to accept, and it is hard to convince others. Okay, this is one of the central principles of Vedanta philosophy. In fact, it's one of the central principles of all wisdom traditions. The idea that we are whole and we are complete. So this is very clearly at odds with our day-to-day experience. We experience a sense of non-wholeness. How do we know we experience this non-wholeness? We chase objects of desire. So when we are chasing objects of desire, we are holding this attitude, when I get that, I'll be happy. So that attitude indicates that I'm currently not. I'm not yet completed. I'm not yet satisfied. Satisfaction, completeness will come when I get that object. So we experience non-wholeness. What we also observe through our experience is that as we chase and attain objects of desire, they don't bring us what we want. They don't bring us a sense of permanent unbroken satisfaction think about it what kind of satisfaction do you want do you want low quality satisfaction medium quality or high quality okay obviously we all want high quality satisfaction how often do you want to feel satisfied do you want pockets of it in between periods of dissatisfaction or do you want to always feel satisfied again pretty obvious We all want a sense of unbroken, high-quality satisfaction. When we acquire the objects of the world, we get a temporary sense of satisfaction which dissipates after some time. We are constantly seeking for this permanent, unbroken satisfaction from the objects of the world. What drives it? What drives this ongoing search for satisfaction? To help us answer this, we go to an analogy. So this analogy is presented by Swami Parthasati in a number of his texts. It's that of a coiled spring. So if you take a spring and compress it, what do you observe against your hand? There's a pressure, there's a tension in that spring. It's seeking to return to its original state. And when you release the spring to its original length, There's no pressure. There's no tension. So how is this relevant? We feel pressurized. We feel tension. We want to get to some rest state. So the analogy here is saying that just as the spring has its original rest state and it gets compressed out of it, so too the individual, you, me, has an original rest state and that we get distorted or twisted out of it. That rest state is our essential self. Essential self as opposed to a non-essential self. So how do we understand this? Think of any of the roles or the identities that you occupy. Mother, father, son, daughter, boss, subordinate, citizen, player, whatever you happen to be. All of these different roles. At different times you wear different hats. No single one of them entirely defines you. It's not essentially what you are. Yes, I'm a mother or a father, but that's not essentially what I am. This idea of an essential self refers to an identity that lies within, which is present in all of your other identities. It is the basis for all of them. That essential self is said to be whole and complete. The problem is that we fall out of identification with that and instead begin to identify with non-essential selves or a false self which we also call ego. 
So it is the ego that believes itself to be incomplete and then craves objects of the world with the fond hope that they will complete you. This lack of wholeness is an illusion. What's happening is that we are seeing ourselves through thought. And we see the same sort of thing in a relative way all the time. You may have heard of the phrase self-limiting beliefs. So someone has the limiting belief, oh, I, I can't sell, I can't be a salesperson. I'm no good at it. That's an identity. I am someone who cannot sell. Where did they get that from? Well, perhaps they had a few experiences where they tried to sell and failed and hated the job. If they had been put through a different experience, a different kind of training, a different kind of support network, if they were selling something they truly believed in, then they may have been more successful as a salesperson. And then their belief would be, I'm a good salesperson. We are seeing ourselves through thought rather than seeing ourselves as we are directly. The desire that we then experience expresses with the sense of I lack such and such. I am whole, I am complete. This is the idea. How do you revel in that? Okay. First thing we need to do is to set aside time for practice. I've got to make this a priority. And there's different aspects of practice that I'll touch on, not especially deeply here, just as a way of introducing them. If there are more questions, then feel free to email them through. The first is reflection. The first is to understand the nature of desire itself. If you look at this small graph on the right hand side, what have we got? We've got a depiction of the level of pleasure that you get compared to the amount of contact that you have. The more you contact something, there is a diminishing return. Take something like food. The example we often draw on is mangoes. First mango of the season is amazing. The next one, a few hours later, is good, but not as good. If you have another one a couple of hours later again, the taste is still there, but it's not as enjoyable. The pleasure goes down over time. So there is a diminishing return. When I get the object of desire, I'm satisfied for a while and then I want something else or I want something more. We adapt to the new circumstance. You get a pay rise, satisfied. Once you adapt to that level of wealth, that new level of income, the same desire emerges for more. So reflect and understand the nature of desire. That the satisfaction you get is fleeting, it's limited, and it has a diminishing return. Nothing can complete me. Now, this is not a pessimistic view. It's a recognition that you don't need to search outside yourself. Second aspect is devotion, which has two aspects, gratitude and wonderment. So gratitude, we're familiar with, it's the practice of putting time aside to be aware of the things that you feel grateful for. Not to be aware of the things that you know you are grateful for, that you feel grateful for. Gratitude's got to flourish or to blossom into wonderment. That's a sense of amazement where the intellect is baffled at the, the beauty that you see around you, at the expression of nature. So getting into nature and seeing the beauty of it, feeling the beauty of it, gazing at the stars. How did the cosmos come into existence? So it's a practice of finding the limits of what you take for granted and recognizing what you do not know and becoming amazed by that. So it takes time, it takes conscious effort. The next aspect is to set inspiring developmental goals. So self-sufficiency, 
that sense that we've already spoken about of nothing can complete me, I am whole within myself. And the other side of that coin is service. Those two have to go together. If you only have a sense of self-sufficiency or autonomy, then you can become disconnected from others and you lose a sense of empathy. So service extends your well-being, extends your autonomy out towards others. So you are both self-sufficient within and connected. As you sit and move towards these goals, you find that you need less and less. If you begin to revel in what you have, I'm already complete. Which brings us to the next aspect, contemplation. So reflection is gaining an understanding of things. Contemplation is to take your intellect, to take your awareness to a particular idea and just sit with it. Who am I? We talk about this idea that I am complete. Who is complete? Who is being referred to when it's said that I am complete? Who is this person thinking about this? The answer to that question is not given in language. The answer to that question is that subjectively felt sense of being the I, the I am at the center of the experience. It's reflecting, it's contemplating on the notion that in this present moment, nothing is missing. It's only when we look to the past, it's only when we look to the future that we have a sense of things being incomplete. In the present moment, everything is complete. Everything is what it is. It's an acceptance of the present. And that's the only safe place to be with regards to the wandering mind and the agitation that it causes. So look deeply into the present moment. What's missing? As you contemplate upon yourself, as you contemplate on the present, the slice of present that you occupy, you begin to recognize that everything is as it ought to be. Now that doesn't mean that you don't act towards change. Both of these things coexist. The final aspect here is to just fulfill your obligations. Do what you believe to be right and hang the consequences. It's when we are trying to act for the ego that we fall out of line with this. We don't do what we ought to do. We do what we think will get us what we want. Forget what you want. Just think about what the right thing to do is and do that. And the final aspect of the question is don't try to convince others. It's not important to convince others. It's something that you adopt for your own reflection, for your own well-being. If someone asks you the question, then by all means, attempt to explain it the best way you know how. If you don't understand it, then admit you don't know and don't try. There's a great verse in the Bhagavad Gita that describes this principle beautifully. He says, Let not the wise man unsettle the minds of the ignorant attached to action. Acting united with the self, let him render all actions attractive. So what's he saying here? Those attached to action are attached because there is strong desire and the belief that this will make me satisfied. If you try to force your other ideas or opinions or ideologies on them, it has a counterproductive effect. They'll reject it because it doesn't make sense and any benefit that there might have been will be lost. Instead, do what? Just act in your own way, feeling complete, with that sense of fulfillment. When you do that, your actions will look attractive, and then you may get inquiries. Then you can speak. How does one revel in the understanding that they are everything without anything? You've got to work towards that understanding. Accept that it might be true. At the moment we don't know that it is true. 
but imagine the scenario in which it is. Understand what it means and then simply sit with the principle. How do you learn to appreciate not the adding or chasing of desires, but the understanding that we are whole? Recognize the limitation of chasing and acquiring objects of desire. It's hard to accept and it's hard to convince others. Yes, it's hard to accept, but with time and with effort towards our growth, it becomes more clear that you need less and less to make you happy. It's hard to convince others, which is good, because you shouldn't be trying anyway. <laughs>